So here I am thinking my whole life that stress is bad for you and has all these adverse health effects. And she's like, nah, it can actually strengthen your heart and make you want to cuddle. Hey everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whenever it is that you're joining us. It's a beautiful summer day here in Connecticut. And whether you've realized it or not, you're listening to The Uncurated Catholic Show. I'm your host, Torin Burke, youth minister and teacher by day, writer, student, thinker of long thoughts by night, and somewhere in between, I like to sit down and share what's been on my heart and occupying my mind. I'm right here each and every week, we may chat about God, we may chat about life, we may chat about poetry, maybe the electoral college, tennis, underwater basket weaving, really whatever seems worth sharing, all in the time it takes me to drink my morning coffee. So, first things first, grab a cup of whatever works for you, and before we begin today's show, make sure you check me out at torinburke.com, or you can always follow the show on Instagram at Uncurated Catholic. Let's get to it. So, welcome back to another season of the show. If memory serves me right, and honestly, it doesn't always serve me right, but if it serves me right in this moment, I think the last episode came out just about 11 months ago, so pretty much a full year. It's been a bit, right? And there's so much to discuss with you over these next 12 episodes, but in keeping with the mission here at the Uncurated Catholic Show, I can promise you that whatever <laughs> all of these episodes shape up to be, I promise that they will be minimally planned and, of course, lacking in production value. But we get enough of that in every other aspect of our lives, right? Everything is so meticulous, and we only kind of present what we want to present. Here, we like to kind of push that aside and just let the Holy Spirit guide and whatever happens, happens, and wherever we end up together, we end up together. So, as always, I've got my coffee and a simple morning blend today, nothing special. But what is special, and what I want to mention, is this awesome 30-ounce mug, 30-ounce mug. It's obnoxiously big. It'd be really great in like a, in like a bar fight. Like, it's, it's massive. You could really club somebody over it. And it says, I'm a teacher. What's your superpower? You see, I'm notorious for always having a coffee cup in my hand at school. I walk around with it everywhere. I pretty much got it all through the school day, even in the afternoon. So it's kind of become a natural gift idea. It's what the kids kind of think about when they want to get me something. This particular mug happened to come from one of my eighth graders around Christmas. And it's awesome because I really only have to fill it up once and it lasts me at least a couple hours, at least to lunch normally. So that's always great. So I figured since this was the first episode of the new season, I would dedicate it to answering some questions um, and not really just get to know you questions, although that is, I think, important, but they're really kind of like faith stuff because if there is one theme at all <laughs> in this program, it is that we like to tie things back to faith. So, you know, it'll give anybody who may be listening for the first time a chance to decide on whether my opinion and my musings are even worth the time. Um, but it also is, is an opportunity for me to kind of maybe go into some of those faith topics that I haven't yet gotten to touch on and maybe might kind of cue me in on some things that perhaps I want to talk about in, in later episodes. But before we get to that, though, I, I wanted to share something that came up just yesterday. You see, stress and mental health in general is a topic near and dear to my heart. You know, I've struggled with all sorts of different things and different phases of my life, and so I try to speak about it as often as I can whenever possible. I was actually invited to give a talk to the Creation Project on the subject. If you don't know who they are, you've got to check them out. Instagram, YouTube, Creation Project, young people doing awesome awesome things, tying in creativity, sharing in their Catholic faith. It's a beautiful thing, very, um, very needed in today's world, I think, especially for young people. I also, I did an episode here about the subject, and you can check that out as well. It actually remains one of the more listened to episodes. Um, it definitely got a lot of um, interaction. It definitely was something that I think people were really, really struck by and that's a beautiful thing, and that's largely why I do this. Um, so if perhaps that's a topic that we can dive in again. I'm sure it will be. I, I wanted to, you know, just mention stress here, you know, because it's, it's important to stay current. It's important to stay moving. The conversation needs to keep going. And though I'm not really going to dive into it in this episode, I want to get to my, my Q&A here. I, I did want to want to talk about something I just learned literally the other day. So I decided a while back that it would be a really fun idea to go back to graduate school 
So I'm actually coming to the end of a program in organizational leadership. And I'll share more about that at a different time. But workplace stress is naturally a huge deal, right? In fact, some surveys have upwards of 50% of Americans as identifying their work as a major stressor in their life, 50%. I came across a researcher named Kelly McGonigal, and if you're, if you're a Harry Potter fan, you probably just smiled, Kelly McGonigal, and she did a TED Talk, I think it was back in 2013, called How to Make Stress Your Friend. I would highly, highly recommend you go find it. Hopefully, I remember to post the link somewhere in Instagram, or I'll post it somewhere, but if I don't, by the time this uh, this uh, episode airs, definitely go check it out. I think it has like 26 million views. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure you could find it pretty easily. Anyways, she actually shares two pretty incredible things. First, that the mere belief that stress is harmful actually makes it more harmful. You see, by changing our perception of stress... For example, like seeing the sweating and our increased heart rate as being signs that our body is preparing to like succeed at a challenge. By looking at it like that, we actually reduce the health risks. I mean, talk about like a mind over matter situation. Second, stress releases oxytocin, which has been called the cuddle hormone because it promotes the desire to be close to others, to empathize with others, to even help others. Now, there are so many other factors like personality, right, type A, type B, and even our environment that makes stress responses a really challenging thing to think about. It's, it's very personal and very unique to people. But the science clearly shows that when we are postured to handle the stressor, right, we can actually find it increasing our social drives and actually improving our cardiovascular function like crazy. How to Make Stress Your Friend, 2013, Kelly McGonigal. You know, you, you grow up hearing that stress is bad. Now, of course, a little bit of stress, right, keeps you motivated, keeps you moving, but, but stress is bad, stress damages your heart, and it's true it does. But Kelly's research seems to open up a whole new category of thinking about stress where it actually can promote wellness. Isn't that, like, even weird to even say it? Like, promotes, promotes wellness, right? We just have to be postured to handle it and to think about it well crazy. I, I am looking forward to um, continuing uh, diving into that research and learning more about that. And perhaps if I discover something, I will be sharing that with you. So I have a couple of questions that supposedly are related to faith. However, I have not seen them. I'm literally looking at them for the first time myself. And so I don't really have any clear sense of what they are. But I want to kind of use it as a springboard, maybe get, you know, some thoughts out there, maybe maybe it'll trigger some sort of conversation. And I'm just gonna kind of share what what comes to mind when I when I read these questions, and uh, we'll go from there. All right. So, question number one: What is something that has brought you joy this week? That's an interesting question because this has actually been a very stressful week. Interestingly, right? We're talking about stress. It's been a very stressful week. I'm not entirely sure, and not to get off into a whole big tangent here, but I'm not entirely sure what triggers my stress responses. Um, there, there's a lot of times when I'm, I'm challenged to do something that's very scary, and I actually rise to the occasion. Actually, I enjoy it. It's, it's an exciting opportunity to grow and push myself, and I really like that. I've kind of always just jumped into the deep end of things. Um... You know, I kind of I joined the Coast Guard right out of high school just because I wanted to go see stuff and do stuff. I didn't really put much put much thought into it. I kind of jumped into seminary because I, I just felt this tugging on my heart to try something radical to kind of give my life radically to Jesus, whatever that meant. And so I'm not really entirely sure what triggers stress, but these last two days have been very very stressful, and it normally it, t it tends to be silly things. Like organizing events, which ironically is a big part of my job, especially in the summer, right? Like organizing like youth ministry events. I guess I'm a type A where I, every little detail really matters. I don't really let things go. And so every logistical consideration is just so important to me. And I also tend to struggle with delegating. So I take a lot on myself. 
And that makes for very, very difficult kind of piling up of tasks. And then I, I eventually just don't know how to dig myself out. So that was kind of one of these weeks. Um, yeah, so what brought me joy? I, you know, my wife brings me joy, little things. She'll just kind of poke me all of a sudden just to kind of remind me she's, uh, she's there when I'm kind of in my, in my head. I would guess she, uh, she brings me joy. Do you have any special personal devotion like praying the rosary or the Divine Mercy Chaplet? That's an interesting question. I, for those of you non-Catholic folks, have no idea what that is, right? In kind of Catholic perspective, of course, all things lead to Christ. But the way we live out our Christianity comes in many different flavors, right? We are utterly unique. God made us unique. And so what we call charisms or these kind of ways of living out our faith. It's the same faith in Christ, right? We're still members of the same body of Christ, but the way we go about it might look different in our world, in our temporal world. The things we focus on, education or, or health or even just, just deep contemplative prayer or, um, you know, there's countless things. I have a particular devotion to St. John Bosco. I know this question is kind of looking more towards like prayers and stuff. And I, I do have a special devotion to the St. Michael Chaplet. But as far as charisms and, and all personal devotions, I, I really have a special devotion to St. John Bosco. And actually, one of the things besides going back to school that I've been kind of working on and praying about and kind of, uh, kind of bringing into my life... Um, is Salesian spirituality, which I've gotten really big in. In fact, I'm actually in a program I'm, I'm discerning and I am preparing um, to be a promised uh, member of the Sile Association of Salesian Cooperators, which is one of the three communities of the Salesian family first started by St. John Bosco in Italy back in the 1800s. And so um, possibly I in the next six months or so, I might very well be, be making my promise to join them and their work of working with young people. Um, so I, I'm definitely, I want to dedicate a whole episode to that because I, that's a very important, um, very important thing in my life. So I would say that my personal devotion, definitely St. John Bosco, St. Michael Chaplet. If you don't know what that is, check it out. It's, it's, a, it's, it's wonderful. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful blessing to include into your prayer life. Uh, what is your favorite Catholic podcast or YouTube channel? The Uncurated Catholic Show. Duh. No. I, uh, I'll be honest with you. I'm really I'm not a big social media person. It's one of the reasons why I think there's great irony in me doing this show is because I really don't market myself. I, uh, I've, I've had a website since 2014. Um, so what's that? Seven years. And I really, every so often I'll, I'll, I'll put, you know, I'll put a piece up that I wrote, something that kind of strikes my heart, and then months will go by, maybe a year will go by. I really don't uh, share it so directly. It kind of just lives out there. And every so often I get an email, every so often I, you know, somebody will reach out through and I'm like, oh yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> Same thing with the show. It's, it's kind of meant to just live out in cyberspace and whoever stumbles across it, stumbles across it. I, I, I enjoy doing it. I, I enjoy kind of keeping it simple, kind of keeping it basic, um, and largely it's because I, I, I really am not super plugged into the, the YouTube social media world. You know, I like Father Mike Schmitz, of course. I like anything that comes out of Franciscan University of Steubenville. I like, you know, Ascension Presents, all that stuff. Um, goodness, I, I don't even know where to begin. There's this young woman who recently has been really kind of striking me with how clearly and how passionately she defends the faith. Her name's Amber Rose, and she goes by the religious hippie. I guess she got her big break, big break, like, you know, or stars or something. Um, she really got known through, I guess, TikTok, and I guess that's kind of her her main thing. I have i don't know anything about TikTok, but that's kind of her main thing, but she's kind of ventured out into into YouTube stuff and, and Instagram and all that, so... She, I have no idea how old she is, early 20s, I would guess. I think she's in college. Um, she's just very clear and passionate, and she doesn't really, she doesn't dance around the difficult things. And, um, and she seems just kind of like a normal person, which is, you know, not like one of those weirdos. <laughs> you know, we're all weird in, in a lot of ways, but um, she just seems very approachable and very, very likable. So I would definitely go check her out, um, especially if you are kind of a younger, you know, 20 something year old. Now that I've turned 30, 
I've realized that, you know, my life is changing. <laughs> but if you're, uh, if you're a younger person, definitely go check her out. Let's see, a couple more. How do you prepare yourself for Sunday Mass? Ooh, I, I wish I did. Um, and I don't. And that's, yeah, that's, that's a good convicting question because I, I, I really don't. You ought to. And even beyond just, you know, abstaining from food and water an hour before the Eucharist or maybe saying a, a quick prayer, you know, when you get into the pew, it's one of those Catholic things, right? You know, you get in the pew, you kneel down, you say in our father and, you know, there you go. It's just something that we're taught to do. We don't really think too much about it. You definitely should prepare yourself. Um, I live about 30 minutes away from the parish where I work. And obviously I, we worship at because I'm kind of there for, you know, my professional capacities. And so it just makes sense to attend mass there. So about 30 minutes. So we, my wife is not the most, you know, morning person, so much of a morning person. So some, sometimes, and it's my fault oftentimes as well, but sometimes we just struggle to get out the door right at the t right on time and traffic and everything else. We're normally rushing in right, like right at the bell, so to speak. Um, and so it, it, it's sad. It, it really is sad. I wish that we were intentional and perhaps that's something that we need to kind of think about and pray about. It's just even maybe spending a couple minutes of maybe like quiet in the car. I mean, we have 30 minutes together before mass, maybe turn the radio off, say a prayer. Maybe while I'm driving, she can even pull up the readings and just kind of think about what we're going to be hearing in the, in the liturgy of the word. I don't know. I, as I say these, perhaps I'm kind of convicting myself. What book has influenced your spiritual life the most? That's a good one too. I did, I think the last episode of the previous season, I talked about some of the influential books. Um, I would definitely go check that out. I don't want to spend too much time kind of reiterating all that, but there's, it, 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 you, you need a, a well-balanced library. You need to read some really good theology because you can't love what you don't know or who you don't know. And you need to really confront the fact that the world makes the faith seem like a bunch of fairy tales. And that's utterly nonsense. That all throughout Christian history, deep, passionate intellectuals have offered critical, philosophical, sensible, beautiful explanations for the things we believe. It's, they're not arbitrary. Doctrines of the church are not arbitrary. They didn't just pop out of nowhere. And you need to start realizing that, I think, in order to really be able to defend and, and hold, defend yourself from all of the different voices that whisper in our ears. And there are so many of them. You need to kind of fortify yourself so that you can really f have the freedom to, to come to fall in love with Christ. And the first thing is to realize that no matter what clever argument you might hear, the church has heard it. The church has heard it in 50 different forms, and the church has clearly answered it. And so you need to know what those answers are. I definitely would also recommend Hilaire Bellic, um, especially The Path to Rome, which is kind of an adventure work where he walks from France across the Swiss Alps into the city of Rome. And it's part kind of adventure diary. It's part uh, philosophical and theological reflection. It really beautifully ties together the human need to explore and to experience, but also come to understand the transcendent and how God works in our world. I, I, would, I couldn't recommend that enough. That's been huge for me. Do I have a favorite religious order? I have deep respect for the Dominicans from an intellectual perspective. I, some of the, the wisest people I've ever heard, some of the greatest theologians I've heard, um, come to us from the Dominican order. And I think that that's really a great gift that the Dominicans provide the church um, is that, that willingness to truly devote their intellectual powers to doing exactly what I had just kind of previously said, to really facilitating that intellectual discourse, which the world so desperately needs. But I mean, at the, at the heart of it, I think the, my real, besides the Dominicans, I think my real respect is for the Salesians of Don Bosco, of which I potentially could be a member in the Association of Salesian Cooperators. So again, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I, I, I would like to kind of devote a whole, um, a whole episode to kind of unearthing and, and diving into that spirituality.
Have you ever endured a dark night of the soul, just like St. John of the Cross talks about? Absolutely. Um, if you've never read Dark Night of the Soul by St. John of the Cross, um, deep, dense reading, challenging, beautiful, but challenging. It's not kind of a casual go-to. It's, it's something you really have to commit yourself to. Um, yeah, uh, you know, like I said with this week, it was kind of a stressful time. I've, you know, I'm kind of experiencing sort of a dark night as, as we speak, but I've been through enough dark nights to know that the light is on the other side. And so it's just a matter of hope. It's a matter of when, you know, I'll kind of shake the shackles, so to speak, and to kind of, um, regain a, a bigger perspective. If you could be the patron saint of anything, what would it be? Coffee, I suppose. What's your opinion on cry rooms in churches? You know, that's an interesting question. I don't necessarily, I, I understand their functionality and I understand the fact that people desire to kind of desire to respect others. That being said, I think I'm rather opposed to them. Now, of course, here I am with no children yet. Perhaps I'm, <laughs> perhaps I'm not really, uh, my opinion is not all that warranted. However, I, I, I bring the crying babies. I, you know, a, a church full of crying babies, I think is a beautiful thing. You know, I like to, my wife and I always look at each other and, uh, and we, we always smile when babies are crying because it's like, Mom and dad might kind of be stressed and worried and anxious, but they're there and how awesome that is. Cause I, I can't imagine the temptation to having, you know, a bunch of these little ones running around to being like, you know what, let's just forget mass today <laughs> and no, and they're there. And what an awesome witness that is. I, I struggle to get my butt out of bed and get out the door and go to mass. And I, I, I just got to haul myself. And my wife, my wife comes along too. I mean, we don't, we're not responsible for a bunch of little ones to get them dressed and cleaned and, you know, teeth brushed and get them in the car. And so I, I think it's an incredible witness and it's a shame to take that witness and to shove it off into a dark corner or to shove it off into a separate room. Um, I think the witness deserves to be front and center and if you're going to be one of those, you know, angry, stuffy old folks who cringe and scoff at the young couples with the crying babies, shame on you. Let the children come to me, Jesus says, right? Shame on you. More crying babies, please. I'm not for cry rooms. I wish the whole church was just filled with them. Last but not least, who was my confirmation saint and why did I pick him or her? Well, my confirmation saint is Saint Alexander of Jerusalem. You've probably never heard of him. And for good reason. I mean, we don't really know that much about him. It was back in the 300s, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah, he was, I, th I think he was martyred in the Colosseum. I forget what date the Colosseum what, or the gladiatorial games were stopped. I, I know the story of the, of the Catholic monk who went out into the middle of the, the Colosseum and, and kind of appealed to the emperor and gladiatorial games were kind of stopped based on that witness. So this, this must've been before then, but I believe he was, he was eaten by lions. There are so many other saints nowadays, now that I'm a little bit more informed and have lived a couple more years, I was confirmed in my early twenties. I was just about 21 and or rather just after 21. And I'm not, I'm, I really, to this day, I'm not entirely sure. I think the martyrdom was something that was really on my mind. And I suppose I liked the name Alexander. It's, it's such a lame reason. And now that I'm somebody who teaches confirmation and kind of walks with young people as they think about that question, what confirmation name to take on, I, I can't encourage them enough to be like, no, trust me, don't be like me. Like really give some thought. Not that St. Alexander of Jerusalem is not a saint or that he's not praying for me or doesn't have my back in any sort of way, but I, I think he does. I just, I, I feel bad that there's really not any sort of personal connection that I feel to him. and it's, it's a bummer, but nonetheless, there should be hopefully a lot of intentionality with choosing a confirmation saint. So that is mine. But my mug is empty, which means that's all for this episode of the Uncurated Catholic Show. I cannot thank you enough for tuning in and listening. Again, you can reach me at torrenburke.com. That's T-O-R-I-N-B-O-U-R-K-E. Or you can follow the show on Instagram at Uncurated Catholic. If you have any questions or suggestions for future topics, always feel free to reach out. I'm always down to chat about whatever comes to your heart and mind as well. 
and make sure you tune in next week. Why don't we part ways with a word of prayer? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Father, thank you. Thank you for the new beginnings you provide us in every moment. Our bodies are filled with praise and thanksgiving for the love, the mercy, the grace, the forgiveness you give. Even when we fail, you're there waiting to pick us up and to guide us back to the path you have ready for us. Whether we see them or not, you have placed people in our lives to help us follow you. Thank you for those special people. We'll continue to praise you in the storms and praise you in the joys. And thank you, God, for new beginnings. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. All the best. God love you. Benedici Mus Domino. Let us bless the Lord.